from the CPRI Knowledge Hub and CPRIHub.org. This is Research Minutes, a weekly look at new and important research in education. Today we're discussing special education and how a student's race can play a significant role in their being identified with a learning disability. We found that black students who are in heavily white schools are much, much more likely to be diagnosed with disabilities. Roughly one in four black children in heavily white schools get identified with disabilities by fourth grade, which seems quite high. We're speaking with Michigan State University's Todd Elder, who recently led a wide-ranging study of student birth and education records to understand the link between race, school composition, and disability identification. He joined CPRI Knowledge Hub Managing Editor Keith Humiller to discuss his findings and their potential implications for schools, policymakers, and families. If you are part of the decision-making process in determining disability status of a student in a particular school, maybe knowing these results exist will make you think twice about identifying a student as, as disabled. That's right now on Research Minutes. Hi, I'm Keith Humeller, Managing Editor here at the CPRI Knowledge Hub, and today I'm happy to be joined by Todd Elder, Professor and Director of Graduate Studies with the Michigan State University Department of Economics. Welcome, Todd. Uh, thank you, Keith. It's great to be here. Um, so today we're going to be discussing your new MBER working paper, co-authored with Northwestern's David Figlio, MSU Scott Emberman, and American's Claudio Persico, titled School Segregation and Racial Gaps in Special Education Identification. Uh, it's an investigation of how childhood disabilities are identified, specifically in regard to race and school composition. And you report some significant findings, but before we jump into them, I wanted to start, if we can, with just a little bit of context. Why did your team feel that this was an important area of study? Uh, yeah, thanks, Keith. That's a good question. There's kind of two different ways to answer that. I think one of them has to do with the fact that there's been a really strong and long-standing historical racial disparity in uh, within schools. And I think everybody knows about sort of well-known uh, racial disparities in things like test scores and other outcomes. But one of the biggest racial disparities that there's been in the United States has been in special education identification. And it's caused a lot of hand-wringing and a lot of sort of worry about, you know, is this something that, that we should really be worried about? Are there good reasons for this? I think one of the biggest motivations for this was, well, one of the most recent recertifications of the Individuals with Disabilities in Education Act, which really tried to put significant penalties on schools and school districts that had what they call significant disproportionality. And for those of you who don't know what that is, disproportionality is something that, that's gotten a lot of attention in the literature. And what it basically refers to is differences across races ethnicities or other sort of well-defined groups in the fraction of children who get identified with disabilities and who enter into special education. So our study focuses on the state of Florida and the way the IDEA is, is implemented in Florida is that schools and school districts are penalized if there is disproportionality to the extent that if the fraction of kids in one racial group, for example, who are identified as needing special education services is more than three and a half times as large as the fraction in another racial group. So to put it bluntly, black children in the U.S. are more likely to be identified as having a disability and requiring special education services than, than white children are. So if, if the fraction of black children defined as disabled are three and a half times as large or more than the fraction of white children, then the school faces financial penalties. And sort of implicit in these in these legislations is the idea that the disproportionality is a bad thing. There's some sort of underlying, underlying true disability rate, and that shouldn't vary across racial and ethnic groups. So that's kind of the one way that we thought this was an important area to study. And the second way, the second method by way of background that made us think that this was interesting is some older work that I have done with uh, some co-authors that suggests that children being identified with disabilities or other behavioral disorders is in some sense a function of their classmates. 
so for example, one of the pieces that, that we'd, we'd worked on was a paper about the effect of your age in your your relative age in your school cohort on the likelihood of being diagnosed with ADHD. And it turns out that children who are relatively young for their cohorts are much more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD than children who are relatively old. And basically the idea here is that there's some suggestive evidence that teachers and school administrators use relative comparisons across children to identify who has a behavioral disorder which maybe isn't shocking when you think about it, but, but it's kind of unsettling. If you think that a behavioral disorder is driven by some true underlying genetic factor, that shouldn't be related to when you're born in the calendar year. And that shouldn't be related to the composition of your peers. And so, so we found that, that it was. That old study about ADHD kind of motivated what we're looking at here. The idea that if you're identified with a disability, it might have something to do with not just you. It has to do with who your classmates are. And as you mentioned, previous studies have looked into disproportionality, but your team utilized a a unique data source for this study that links birth and education records for every child born in the state of Florida over a 10-year span from 1992 to 2002. Did that allow you to bring a new level of analysis to this issue? Uh, I think so. Uh, we, We would argue so, I guess. We have, like like you said, the universe of every child born in Florida over a 10-year span. And probably the most interesting thing about the Florida data, it's a merger of education records with health records. So, and, and that's, I think, what, what makes it really unique that we can kind of follow these, these children from birth up through their school years. So we have very detailed information about information on their health at birth. So things like birth weight, gestational age, whether there was a congenital anomaly, whether there were any uh, birth complications, that sort of thing. So we have really detailed information on what's available on birth certificates, and then we have really detailed information about what happens to them while they're in school. Uh, and so that's, I think, what maybe uh, maybe allowed us to have some novel analyses. I mean, the idea of this paper is comparing two identical children that look exactly the same on the basis of how they looked when they were born and earlier in their school years, and does the likelihood that those children are identified with disability diagnoses depend on other things besides their own characteristics? Uh, Your paper details a a range of different findings, including some significant links between, as you were discussing earlier, a school's racial composition, that sort of comparative analysis rather than objective analysis of uh, students who are identified with a disability. But I'd like to look a little bit more broadly first, if possible. Did you have any general findings that seem to cut across all schools? Yeah, that's a good point. It makes sense to back up a little bit. The first thing we did in the paper was just trying to look at a simple question, which is, is there evidence of disproportionality for minority students? And the nice thing about our data, again, is that we have very big data set and very detailed information that we can condition on. So we see that there are for example, black-white differences in disability rates, is that true when we condition on detailed measures of health at birth and detailed measures of, of economic resources of the parents? And basically what we found is that despite some of the literature you know, implying otherwise, there, there actually is kind of a early on in school, there is disproportionality in the sense that more white children get identified with disabilities than minority children those gaps close throughout the school years. So in kindergarten, for example, white children are roughly 25 percentage points more likely to be identified with a disability than black children are. And by grade four, that gap is closed. We looked at some different disability categories, which I think is some of the most interesting stuff about the paper, because we have disability categories like intellectual disabilities, physical disabilities. We sort of started with the idea that, well, physical disabilities that fairly objective, you either have them or you don't. And and it turns out it's it's sort of interesting because white children are much more likely to be classified as physically disabled as black children. That holds throughout the throughout school years. Differences in uh, birth characteristics between black and white children don't don't explain any of that difference. Intellectual disabilities, we find exactly the opposite pattern that black children are much more likely to be identified with intellectual disabilities than white children. Both in kindergarten, by fourth grade, black children are roughly three times as likely to be identified with intellectual disabilities as as white children are, which is sort of astounding. And some of that can be explained by characteristics available on birth certificates. 
and socioeconomic measures of the parents, but but not all of it. So that that sort of three times number is, you know, it's kind of astounding when you think about it, but I should probably put it in perspective because that's a very rare disability category. So among among black children, roughly one in 10 black children who are identified with disabilities or identify with this particular intellectual disability category. So it's maybe not quite as dramatic as it sounds, but it, it uh, still uh, triple the rate of white children is is uh, fairly striking. Sure. And some of the, the more noteworthy findings in your paper, as we were discussing before, describe how special education identification differs between schools that have smaller or larger minority student populations. So could you walk us through what you were looking for there? Yeah. Like I said, I think that's probably the, the really the central part of the central theme of the paper is that peers matter. And peers matter in in a lot of ways. And peer minority, sort of the, the, the fraction of students who are minority seems to matter quite a bit. So in the first analysis that, that I was just talking about, we're really trying to compare say, a black student to an observationally similar white student. In this analysis, where we're looking at how things vary by school racial composition, I think the the thought experiment there is to think about a black student in a heavily white school and compare that student to a black student in a heavily minority school who otherwise is observationally uh, similar. So that's basically what we found, that black students who are in heavily white schools are much, much more likely to be diagnosed with disabilities than black students in heavily minority schools who look identical based on the information we have on birth certificates and, and information, other information we have from the schools. And I think that's kind of the smoking gun that peers matter. I mean, one of the things that we speculate about in the paper is that minority students, you know, both black and Hispanic students in really heavily white schools, they look different than the other students in the school, and maybe they, they attract a lot of attention from teachers, and teachers might unknowingly pay a lot of attention to those students, and if there's something that they see that seems amiss, or, or, or if they're not performing well in class, then they get referred to referred to a specialist for disability diagnoses. And I think that was that was one of the things, again, starting from this from this work many years ago about about ADHD diagnoses and stuff. I mean, the idea that your disability diagnoses depend on your peers, I think is, to me at least, that it's really unsettling because we would like to think that these things are defined by some objective standard. If you have an intellectual disability, that there's some objective standard that uh, defines whether you do or whether you don't. And our results suggest that that's not really the case, that that standard is, there's some slippage. It depends on what type of school that you're in. Our first reaction to that, you know, besides saying, oh, goodness, this, this doesn't seem like a good thing, was to, to kind of focus on the role of school resources. So basically, you know, let me, I'll, I'll just sort of throw some, some figures at you. So something like roughly one in four black children in heavily white schools, and by heavily white, I mean greater than 90% white population, one in four black children in those schools get identified with disabilities by fourth grade which seems quite high. Among black children in schools with less than, with fewer than 10% white students, it's more like one in eight, one in 10 children. So over twice as, over twice as many black children uh, as a fraction are identified with disabilities in heavily white schools than in heavily minority schools. And I think our first reaction was to say, oh, well, that probably has to do with the fact that the, that the heavily white schools have a lot of resources that because those schools have lots of resources to lots of money to deal with schools deal with students with disabilities that's why we're getting higher identification rates in those schools but and we kind of go through a lot of different steps in the paper to try and shed light in this issue and basically we don't find really any evidence of that we we find that it's due to something else it 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 doesn't seem to be we seem to unable be unable to explain that things due to resource patterns so yes, the heavily white schools are richer, but that doesn't seem to be what explains why students in heavily white schools are much more likely to be identified with disabilities. That You actually partially answered my next question a little bit already, but I think some of our listeners may be wondering if your findings are influenced by something other than race or if something other than race might be contributing to this, say a student's economic status or as we were just discussing school resources. So you, it sounds like you were able to control for those factors in your study. Yeah, so I think that's again that's kind of the you know after we found the first the first evidence that this result held 
we spent much of the rest of the paper trying to look into these these other things besides race might be explaining these things. And yeah, I think one of the first piece of evidence about this that's interesting is that the patterns we find for minority students are exactly the opposite of the patterns we find for white students. And by that, I mean a white student in a heavily white school is less likely to be identified as being disabled than a white student in a heavily minority school. It sort of suggests that being sort of unique or being a minority in the within school population might matter a lot. The other big piece of evidence that we brought to bear was it was trying to look at school resources directly, and we didn't really find any, any effect of school resources on the likelihood of being diagnosed with a disability. So we don't think that that's probably a big part of what's, what's going on. One other thing that might be going on, I think we spent a lot of time thinking about this issue, is achievement. So it might be the case that students are identified with disabilities based on where they lie in the school achievement distribution. So, you know, if a student who scores at the 50th percentile on a statewide test is in a school where the 50th percentile is near the bottom of that school's level, uh, of of that school's uh, test score distribution, they might be more likely to be identified with a disability than if you score at the 50th percentile and you're in a school where that is near the, the top of your within school achievement distribution. And we found some evidence that that's the case, but again, that it wasn't able to explain all of the racial racial composition gradient that we found. For the most part, it just looks like it looks like race itself might be might be what's going on here. That for black students in particular, and to a lesser extent for Hispanic students, but for black students, the likelihood of being diagnosed with a disability seems frankly, just very closely related to how many other black students there are in the school. If there's not a whole lot of other black students in the school, those students are quite likely to be diagnosed with a disability compared to if they have a lot of black classmates. And I know that this is an economic analysis, but has your team given any thought to some possible explanations for that? Why might, you know, simply being an outlier racially from the rest of the student body, has the team given any thought to that at all? Or It's like you said, this is you know, we're economists and we, we, we might be good at thinking about things in some ways, but I, I think we've sort of racked our brains about this issue and not really come up with anything anything particularly coherent other than what I've already suggested, which is that we don't really know why. I think, I mean, like I said, there's a lot of things going on here. School resources do play a role, uh, a small role. Test scores and achievement distributions do play a role, but sort of what explains the this sort of theory that we have that it's it's kind of your uniqueness. Like if you're the only black kid in a in a class of 25 children, that, that sort of the teacher's eyes sort of naturally focus on you and, and any behavioral problem you might have is more uh, sort of magnified. I, I don't really think we have a great reason for why that is other than it sort of seems, it seems plausible that this is the case. It would be nice to have data, you know, where you ask teachers you know, sort of how much interaction they have with particular students or how much time do they spend focusing on particular students. But, but I don't know. I, and, you know, while I'm, while I'm talking about it, I, if, if I can sort of answer a question that you didn't really ask, which was that, you know, I'd mentioned before that we have these different disability categories. The main categories that we focus on in the paper, as mentioned before, were things like physical disabilities, intellectual disabilities. We also have categories, autism spectrum disorder, speech and language disabilities. And the last one is called specific learning disabilities. And I didn't know a whole lot about these categorizations before I started working on this project, but that specific learning disability category, that's kind of a catch-all for a lot of disabilities that are sort of hard to classify otherwise. So things like dyslexia, uh, which refers to reading difficulties, or dyscalculia, which refers to math difficulties, we find that almost all of our patterns, almost all of our findings are driven by this specific learning disability category. And I think I think it does make a little bit of sense ex post because those are the disability categories that sort of intuitively seem to be the most malleable. Physical disabilities, I think those are pretty objective. Intellectual disabilities, autism, you know, you could quibble with those, I suppose, but I, I think they're relatively object- objective. But this specific learning disability category it kind of seems like the wild, wild west a little bit, like sort of in terms of who gets diagnosed with these disabilities and who doesn't. It seems like those are the disabilities that maybe have the most possibility for being really subjectively defined. 
And those are the ones that we see the biggest differences uh, across types of schools. So like I said before, I think black students in schools with lots of black classmates are identified with disabilities at roughly half the rate as, as black students in schools with almost all white classmates. Almost all of that gradient is driven by the specific learning disability sort of catch-all category. None of it's driven by physical disabilities. None of it's driven by intellectual disabilities. So I think that's kind of the smoking gun that, boy, you know, maybe maybe these relative comparisons across students are really what's what's going on here. What do you think are the implications of your work here? You know, what should teachers or school leaders or even families know? And what, if anything, can be done to address some of these disproportionalities? Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a tough question to answer. I think... Um, I think maybe the most important thing about our results are, is just sort of knowing that they exist and I think letting different uh, stakeholders and, and actors in the disability diagnosis process know that these things are going on because maybe, you know, we don't know, but that maybe there's an implicit bias sort of story going on here, right? That maybe teachers in heavily white schools who frankly tend to be white teachers Maybe they might have some implicit bias against against minority students, and we don't we don't know that that that's true or not. But I think knowing that these patterns exist, I think sheds some light on the possibility that maybe that's the case. And so, if you are part of the decision making process in in determining disability status of of a student in a particular school, maybe knowing these results exist will make you think twice about identifying a, a student as as disabled. And, and the same thing for families. I think, you know, families should know that, that, that it is possible that if they move to a different district or a different school with a different racial makeup, then the likelihood that their, their child will receive special education services might change. And the, the $64,000 question here is what impacts this has on students ultimately? So what is the long run impact on a student of being diagnosed with a disability when they shouldn't have? And the flip side of that is what is the long run impact on a student of not being diagnosed with a disability when they're truly disabled? And frankly, the literature on that is really thin, although there are a couple of recent working papers that are trying to make progress on this. But frankly, I think people don't really know the answer to that question that well because it's not there, there's not really a good identification strategy for this. That sounds like a, a really interesting realm for future research. That was actually going to be my next question for you. Um, do you see any opportunities here for future research, either for your team or for others who are working in this area of special education identification? I think so. I think that's a good question. I spent a lot of time trying to convince you how great these Florida data are, but you might want to see if this happens in other states. There might be something unique about Florida, and it would be nice to see if this was something that occurs sort of more generally in the U.S. or, or worldwide. And then the other angle for future research is uh, is what we were just talking about, about what credible evidence of the effect uh, of special education on student outcomes, because we really don't have much credible evidence on this right now. One of the working papers that I was that I was mentioning before that's that's looking at this was is studying in Houston recently, maybe in the last decade, uh, the Houston school district set a cap on how many students could be identified as disabled in a particular school. And so, and I believe that cap was something like 10%. So if you're in a school with 20% of students are, are, are receiving special education services, starting in the year that the policy went into effect, half of those students have to get cut off. They just They just pulled the plug on them. And so there's a working paper out right now looking at that sort of comparing outcomes of students in those schools who got, you know, who got the, the special education uh, designation taken away from them versus students in schools that weren't affected by the policy, i.e. students in schools that had special education uh, rates lower than the, than the district mandated maximum. And I think that's a really, really interesting uh, uh, way to, to think about that and a really interesting way to get at this issue because you know, again, I think our paper is, is a good first piece of the puzzle in the sense that it presents pretty suggestive evidence that special identification classification is malleable and is influenced by the characteristics of your classmates and the characteristics of your schools, not just your own characteristics. But the obvious follow-up question to that is, well, so what? You know, <laughs> does that does that affect you later on? And I think I think there's some papers, uh, you know, in the works now that are that are going to be able to shed some light on that. Well, I agree with you that this is a really thought-provoking first step, as you said, and it does raise a lot of questions and 
this does seem like an area that's worth keeping an eye on going forward. So I'm so glad that we had the, the chance to discuss this study here today. So for our listeners who want to learn more, I, I really recommend going to read the full working paper. It's titled School Segregation and Racial Gaps in Special Education Identification, and it's been published in the National Bureau of Economic Research. Todd Elder, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Keith. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to this week's Research Minutes, presented by the CPRE Knowledge Hub. For more episodes of this podcast, or to subscribe to this series, visit us at cprehub.org. That's cprehub.org. To share thoughts on today's episode, or to suggest future topics, follow us on Twitter at cprehub.